Friends, welcome to the Nation's Weekly Podcast. I am glad to have you back, Joel. It's great to be back. I miss you when you Although I am... Uh... I'm on cough drops today, so I apologize for the eucalyptus, and uh, I might need to excuse myself from the mic here and so there. So if I'm sick on the podcast next in the week. near future, then you know it's this guy's fault. But you won't be. You will be gone right. next week. I so. will be fly fishing in Reno next week, so you're going to be not all alone. You're going to have the more than capable, yes. the brilliant, the wonderful Claire Henning. Yeah. Um, we've got a couple of great guests next week. We're going to sit down with James Barkman. Uh, and hear about his return from Burma being in the field. Yep. And we're going to talk to Jeff Rosine, president of Kids Around the World, and figure out Incredible why. Incredible ministry, building yeah. playgrounds and war zones. Yeah. Um, I don't know many people who are doing that, so that's going to be a rich conversation. And but we, tell us, who do we have today? So today on the podcast is, I. this is not me being superlative. This is me just being honest. One of my favorite people in all of North County, San Diego. I second that. Um, he's handsome. He's true. charismatic. He's it's true. Multi-talented. <laughs> it's very true. He has an easy laugh. <laughs> he is the one and the only Roy and Zunza, also known as El Chappie. Um, <laughs> he's. You can go actually check out his website. Uh, but Roy is many things besides being a dear friend. He is actually technically the first host of the new. Um, video series that we are launching, I think coming out this next week or the week after called Destinations. It'll be next week. Yeah. And so this, uh, yeah, this is like a big, big media week for Roy and Sunza. <laughs> the podcast and the, the first episode of Destinations. You guys are yep. the worst. <laughs> Roy, we followed Roy down to across the border to Tijuana and, to meet Doña Maria, and so you guys will get to see that story soon. But a little bit about Roy, and then we're going to jump into the conversation. Roy has his master's in chaplaincy and pastoral care and counseling from Bethel Seminary. He is a certified spiritual director through that program at USD, and he is currently completing a doctorate in leadership at Fuller Theological Seminary. Yay. <laughs> Um, and it's he, only taken me 16 years to do all of that. Hey, <laughs> your kids might beat you through college. The, They're well, starting college and you're just now. I'm, yeah. And I'll still be working on it. <laughs> Thanks, Joel. Well, Roy, you're, you're a uh, good thing takes time. We're, we're so thankful to have you here. Um, yeah, let's, uh, let's dive in a little bit where, you know, what gave you a passion to, you know, start with, you know, some of these degrees in spiritual formation and, and, uh, in, in just caring for others. You have, it's, uh, there's a commonality in a lot of your degrees, um, for the other. And mm -hmm. so talk to us a little bit about that. Where did that come from? That's a really good observation, Joel. I didn't think of it like that. Um, yeah. So, uh, I'm, let me set the record straight. I am not an academic and I'm not a scholar. I'm what you call like a, a practical theologian and I just want to be a good chaplain. So I'm just trying to get tools uh, to uh, provide care, to provide soul care to people. Um, and so that was uh, a big, like, that was the big uh, uh, precipice to get education. I did come from a, a, a denominational Pentecostal holiness background that, that did not value seminary. <clears throat> um, uh, I mean, they had their own Bible colleges, but they were, it was... Um, uh, it was only like a year or two. So, uh, but I, um, my mom, she never went to college and, um, uh, but she was a big reader. And so I'd always see her reading mm -hmm. and she, uh, if you called her and you were speaking English, she had perfect English. If you called her and you were speaking Spanish, she had immaculate Spanish. I mean, it, I mean, she just sounded so educated in English and in Spanish and never went to school. Um, um, and so I, I think it was her that gave me a value for learning. And um, I, I think I had my first theology book when I was like 14 years old. Mm. Um, and um, so I, I just, I've had a value for learning um, mainly because I feel like I don't really know much um, and I, I feel like I'm trying to catch up. Mm. And so, uh, Probably like the common denominator is that I, I every time like I get into stillness or silence, I hear this like phrase to be like a physician of the soul. Mm -hmm. Like I want to be like this person that provides soul care. Um, and I know that we're like in this era where it's, um, you know, some call it like therapeutic deism, right? Yeah. Where like we, we, we venerate 
uh, uh, therapy and, and I, I get therapy. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm part of that. And not, but, but, and Mm -hmm. I also think that the Christian tradition and the great religions have something to say about the soul Mm -hmm. that, uh, in some ways therapy, oh God, I'm going to, I feel like I like, I feel like I'm going to get in trouble for saying this, but that therapy can't do Yeah, like, there's just something that, and there's things that therapy can do that soul care can't do. Mm -hmm. Right. And so it's this marriage. Uh, so yeah, I've just had this value for, um, if I'm going to be a chaplain, I want to, I want to have tools and I want to be true to the form and I want to be shaped and formed by our tradition and to be accountable to something and to someone about how to do that well. And what do you, yeah. Well, I want to apologize to you and to our listeners for being a bad host. Use the term chaplain a couple of times. And I failed to mention that um, besides your educational accolades, like you function as a corporate chaplain yeah. and you started a, what was originally a corporate chaplaincy business offering mm-hmm. that sort of service to a variety of different clients. And I know that's that's yeah. been evolving as you guys have been thinking about mm-hmm. its mission and, and vision for that. So maybe we can unpack that a little bit later. But yeah, great observation, Joel, the, the, the caring of people. And I love the distinction that you made, Roy, about, hey, uh, it's not that therapy is bad or the end all um, or that religion is bad in the end all, but it's right. this marriage, this fruitful marriage between 100%. the two that can start helping to create healthy people mm-hmm. and also, also help create um, healthy culture. So I'm, okay, so you mentioned that your mom's this kind of big impact on you is where you started to get some of your value for education and you grew up in a Pentecostal holiness tradition. Um, mm-hmm. How long were you in that sort of space? So um, we've been, um, uh, we were in that space since I was, I was born into it Mm -hmm. and I didn't leave it until I was in my early twenties. So that had a really big lasting impact on me. Um, and then the second place that we've been the longest is at North coast Calvary. Mm. Uh, we, we did a couple of stints. I did a stint at the vineyard, uh, as I was discerning church planting. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we visited another church, uh, recently, as we were, Christine and I were just tussling with what does it look like to embody uh, values of justice, mm-hmm. um, and so we we tried out a, a couple different places, and North Coast just kept pulling us right back in, um, and so we're uh, I, I'm telling people that we we are reintegrating ourselves back into North Coast. Uh, it hasn't been very hard because I've been connected to you guys for <laughs> this whole time, um, but those two pl- uh, North Coast and the Pentecostal background have been where I've been the longest. Mm. Uh, as far as church is concerned. So what's the holiness movement? This is Pentecostal holiness. Like talk, to, what is that? Yeah, so uh, I'm sure others are able to describe it a lot better than I can. Uh, the, the, the holiness part, and the reason I say the holiness part is because there's a lot of Pentecostal slash charismatic non-denominational churches now. The holiness piece were set of practices that um, that the local church body uh, would um, inhabit. So it would be, um, you had to wear a suit and tie. Oh, okay. Women had to wear dresses. Did you as a kid? Yeah. Wow. I, I The last time, um, I mean, I was the rule breaker. And when I was like 16, 17 years old, I was like, I'm not wearing any more suits. Did you wear your Dodger hat? Uh, yeah, I basically did. <laughs> like I started showing up on the stage with jeans, windbreaker, and a hat. And I was like, I don't care anymore. Like, I, I'm just not doing this anymore. How was that received? Was that I mean, point it, of contention? It, was that like I mean, excommunication? What I, does that mean? I got lucky because we were, we were part of a church that was starting to trend towards like saying what really matters. Mm. And so... Um, and so there was a lot of grace, but there was, but, but I was also part of a Latino church that was very conservative politically and religiously and culturally. And so we had an English service and a Spanish service. And I loved, I probably loved the Spanish service a lot more, but, but there were people that were very black and white thinkers in both services that were like, mm-hmm. you know, they'd call, they'd call you brother, right? Brother Roy or hermano Roy, right? Um, you, you, you shouldn't be dressing like this. This does not please the Lord. Mm. You know, um, and then like women couldn't wear makeup. They had to wear, you know, dresses, uh, veils. Um, 
couldn't go to the movies, couldn't go to dances. I got I got nominated prom king my senior year in high school, and I had like guilt, right, and shame for uh. for being voted. And so I remember going to one of the associate pastors, and I and I tell him, I said, Pastor, I'm conflicted about going to prom. And he says, Well, Roy, you know, you're a youth leader here, and you need to set an example. And you know, we have a standard, and we're not of this world, mm. and you should not go. And my 18 year old self righteous. Well, I, I wouldn't even say self-righteous. I was trying to please God, yeah, right? Earnest. I, yeah, I was trying to please God, and I'm like, you know what? That sound. You're right. Like, I'm I'm not gonna go, and they'll see, right? And and I still think about that story, like yeah. you know, thirty plus years or whatever mm. later. See, it's the hard thing about legalism is like it's not. I don't think anyone woke up one day or like, hey, let's let's take good theology and and ruin everyone's life and let's become miserable. Like there there is a holy reverence there that's really beautiful. 100%. And, um, you know, I, I think, cause yeah, that's a little bit of my background too. I was really drawn to legalism when I was saved in the mid nineties because I came from complete rebellion. I, mm. I came from like, I was the king of my life. I could do whatever I want and I was ruining my life. And so yeah. when someone told me how to dress, how to be, how to, how to read God's word, I mean, just give me the rules. And so I was actually really drawn to it, but the problem is that eventually, yeah, I think um, y the fruit of that becomes one that is just, it's just, it's not very inviting for the rest of the world. It's like, it's like to look like Jesus doesn't mean to wear a suit and tie. It doesn't mean yeah. to not dance. You know, it's just, right. it's, that's not, that's not the avenue in which we receive, you know, the fullness of who Christ is, unfortunately, but. Well, you know, uh, to me, it's very complex because there's a part of me that loved the structure of my Pentecostal Holiness Church. I knew where I stood yeah. socially, yeah, right, and even re like spiritually, right. Like if I did X, Y, and Z this week, I was good with God, mm. right, and I was good with the people. If I didn't do that, and that did something to my my pleaser mode in me, like I know how to please God and other people now. Right. Mm -hmm. And my young self didn't know any better. Right. As you get older, as you start to, you know, uh, develop, uh, you know, emotionally, you start to you're, you're wondering, like, do I have to wear a suit? Like, <laughs> no, I don't have to wear a suit. Right. You know, can I go to the movies? Yeah. Right. Uh, you know, can I go to a dance? I, absolutely. You know, am I still um, am I still responsible for my actions, for my thoughts, my deeds, my words, my motives, 100%. Does God care about all of that? 100%. But there isn't that sense of shame anymore. Yeah, sure. Right? And, and I think that's what legalism does is that it just like festers in shame, mm -hmm. which is what cripples the soul. Yeah. It makes me want to hide. It makes me want to go inward. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how did you go from you're raised in this rich, thick, um, kind of spiritual and social community that you're describing that's marked by uh, conservatism or fundamentalism and this kind of set apartness. So how do you go from that to something like corporate chaplaincy, which I have never heard of before, or towards like, when I think of you now, I think of, oh man, Roy is this shining example of somebody who can go into any situation and be, uh, to be warm, to be curious, to be non-judgmental, to bring the presence of God, who believes that like, who doesn't believe really in this, this hard and fast distinction between sacred and secular, but thinks that actually the Holy Spirit's constantly doing something to subvert those sorts of categories that we set up. So what's the journey from that Pentecostal holiness background out of that? You mentioned that you left it at some point. So like what caused the rupture and where did you go? Yeah. Um, you're really kind, man. <laughs> you are so kind. <laughs> Both of you guys are. I mean, you, you know, to, um, you guys are just very kind and caring. Um, we know. <laughs> and we humble. Know. <laughs> um, it's all a show just for the podcast. Yeah, it's, That's just, right. it's just because the mics are hot, Roy. You guys are, now you guys are dumb. <laughs> Uh, There's the there friend. You got That's it. what we were looking for. <laughs> Cheers. Finally. We broke through. We broke through. Uh, what precipitated that? Um, I had like this deep gut intuitive sense that like 
uh, God was um, way more than like, am I pleasing him or not pleasing him? Mm. That um, interestingly, in Pentecostal holiness sermons, you don't hear about the love of God or you don't hear about the belovedness of Jesus. Mm. Um, and so I, I was trying to one day remember if I had ever heard a sermon right on, on belovedness and I couldn't. Mm. And in my mid 20s, I started reading this this dude who wrecked my life. Uh, and then he introduced me to another guy. Uh, I started with Brennan Manning oh. reading Abba's Child. Yeah, um, <clears throat> so good. And, uh, you know, I'm in my mid 20s. Uh, I'm coming out of like um, pur purity culture, right? Conservative evangelicalism. And, um, uh, and I start reading about uh, God's love and him calling me you know, his son, a beloved son, mm. right? A child of God. And then that precipitated into reading now mm. right? And um, I think it was through those, through those texts that I, I started to wonder, like, th there's got to be like, m there's got to be a more powerful motive and like a more powerful energy, so to speak, that is a lot more inspiring and motivational than like I'm getting up and it's like uh, the drudgery and judgment of God, mm -hmm. right? And then like having to do all these lists of things to perform, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, there, there had to be something inside that uh, uh, and transcendent that was like better gas, <laughs> right? It was yeah. premium gas, mm -hmm. right? Uh, um, like I wanted to please God, but I didn't want to do it out of fear. I wanted to do it out of delight. Mm. I wanted to do it out of joy. I wanted to do it out of deep desire. Mm. And um, and I think that's what started like shifting. And then there was some pain points that happened in the church. The church split. The the pastor was uh, 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 becoming more manipulative and controlling, mm. right? And it it was it turned into a very toxic environment. And so I knew when I was getting, uh, so the, the turning point for me to leave was I was thinking about the story of Jonah and I thought, okay, if, if, um, I'm going to, we're going to leave all of this. So I'm going to get into the ship. Right. And if, if this is the wrong thing to do, then I'm going to get tossed out of the ship and I'm going to get swallowed up by the whale and I'll return back. Mm. That's literally how my mind wow. rationalized leaving. Yeah. Like I thought if God is really like redemptive, if God is really all powerful, if God is really loving and I need to stay in this like toxic environment, then I'll somehow be brought back. But if not, like I'm done, mm. like, and I'll end up, you know, hopefully being a faithful prophet, right. Or whatever, a follower of God. Mm. Right. And obviously I didn't, I mean, if anything, my anxiety levels started to subside. I had a lot of anxiety. I had a lot of panic attacks during that time. They started to, to subside the more I was leaving that mm -hmm. toxic environment. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, that's going to be a good thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not as depressed anymore. So it was actually part of it was pain also to say, like, I can't do this anymore. Mm -hmm. This is really painful. Mm. So do you have a whale moment? Um, uh, yeah, I, I had a whale moment with uh, a couple of people that were in my life that were probably like two or three steps ahead of me leaving our, that denominational background. And so they were like my safe haven. They were like my, you're not crazy. Yeah. You know, like you, you, this, it's okay. You're going to be okay. Yeah. Um, and I think they were like my, my, my whales, so to speak. And, uh, it was, it, it was, um, the, the funny thing about spiritual community is that it causes the most pain and it causes the most healing and wholeness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or we're, we're so, I can't remember where I heard it, but, uh, I'll never forget the, the phrase of, you know, we're wounded in community and we're healed by community, yeah, it's so which true. is just yep. another way of saying exactly what you did right there. Also, I apologize for mischaracterizing the Bible. That nowhere does it say that it's a whale. It's a large fish. That's right. That's okay. It's got to be accurate here. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Um, okay, well, I want to move on to, because one of the reasons why I 
wanted to have you on the show, besides the fact that I think that your own journey and your ability to articulate it um, is beautiful and powerful and, and has really helped me put language to some of my own inner experience um, and has encouraged me to lean into community when I've wanted to detach from it. Uh, so thanks for that. Mm -hmm. But is uh, it's uniquely because, I mean, I grew up in the church. I, you know, I went to Fuller and I never really heard about this kind of idea of this theology of work or this or the role of a corporate chaplain. So when I met you, I was like, wait, what? Oh, you know, and I started hearing about, I remember listening to Krista Tippett's On Being podcast and starting to hear about the fact that uh, actually in the corporate space in the night after the kind of the, the tech boom and in, in the early 2000s and whatnot, um, people started realizing that spiritual care and spirituality uh, really mattered to employees overall health and and corporations health and that could impact things like creativity and innovation and ultimately you know bottom line and so um you go from this world that you described um how do you end up in like pursuing spiritual direction how do you end up um in becoming a chaplain yeah um i i'll when I was uh, in my early 20s, um, I, I wanted to go to seminary, and, and uh, my dad, um, he, he said, he was a former pastor, and he said, son, he says, um, go figure out how the world works. Go work in the world. Mm -hmm. He says, you're always going to have a chance to go to seminary. You're always going to have a chance to be a minister and serve. Go figure out what it's like to make money. To, to, to work and to figure out what that looks like. Mm. And so he says, why don't you go study computers, right? I'm 18 years old. I'm, I'm just getting out of high school. I had, I had no plans. So I listened to my dad and I went to go study computers. And uh, uh, my first job, I was a systems analyst and I was troubleshooting tier three. Uh, I was tier three support. So you know, when you call tier one, they're going to escalate it. When they call tier two, it's a problem. When they call tier three, it's a system wide problem. Like mm. it's, there's something really bad. So I started to learn how to do that. Um, and, um, worked for a couple of companies that were like 30,000 plus employees. I mean, these were wow. really big corporations. Um, and, um, uh, I, I, uh, I, I'm sharing this because in part, uh, the workplace did something to me that got me to start thinking about how do I increase my level of competency? Like, how do I become a master at something? How do I develop and grow, you know, professionally? And I don't feel like the church was, I mean, not that the church should do that, but the church that I grew up in didn't have a capacity to think about itself outside of the walls or the people outside of the walls, mm. right? Like if you're always in church, if you grew up in church, then your imagination is all about the church. It's mm. not like what, what this, how this looks like lived out right in the world, the workplace, like hit me with the reality of like, people aren't talking about spirituality. They, they, they're, they're trying to figure out how to be good workers. They're trying to figure out how to make money. They're trying to figure out how to pay their bills. Right. You know, mm -hmm. it was otherworldly for me. So that was really formative. Um, and that got my juices thinking a lot more as well. Like there's gotta be more than just going to Sunday church. Mm -hmm. There's gotta be more than, th than that. Right. There's a whole world out here being lived Monday through Friday and all I'm concerned about and thinking about is what's going to happen next Sunday. Like something's wrong here or, or not wrong, but something's happening Balanced. here. Yeah. There, there's something going on here. Right. Um, and so I think between that, between the pain that was happening, leaving an old church system, um, and then, and then Christina, my wife pointing out one day, she's like, you, you, I could see my office from our apartment where we lived. We lived in Orange County near the, 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 the block of Orange. If you've ever been there, like it's just a, it's a mall, right? I could see my office from my window and it would take me from the moment I leave my door to my cubicle, it took me five minutes. So I would come home for lunch, take a nap, go back, right? <laughs> uh, me and the boys afterwards would go hang out. We 
that's when Dave and Buster's was cool. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we'd go get a drink afterwards. Was it though? It was. <laughs> it was. It's not anymore. Ski ball and Coors That's right. right. We thought it was this is like adult Chuck E. Cheese, right? <laughs> um, but uh, uh, but she said one day, like, why are you so depressed? We're you're in our, we're in our second year of marriage. You know, we're we we make decent money. You're you're working close. Why are you so depressed? And I said something is missing inside of me. Mm-hmm. Like there's something in me that's saying like there's got there's like I feel called to something. But again, it was that sign of like pain. It was like mm. depression. It was something's off, right? And it was Christina actually that said, well, then you need to go pursue ministry in some capacity. Mm. So it was all those small interchanges that. Or exchanges that helped me to think through, like, all right, I'm, I'm leaving everything that I knew, right? I'm leaving what we called Egypt, and I'm going into this wilderness, that, and I don't know where I'm going. Now I feel like Abraham, right? Where it's like, go to a, you know, leave, mm-hmm. right? It's not like go here, it's leave, mm-hmm. right? Or, or like Moses being told, leave here. Well, where are we going to go? Well, I'll, I'm going to show you a land, but it's going to take some time for you to get there. <laughs> so I'm in this like wilderness phase. Mm-hmm where um, I don't know where I'm going, but I, but I know that I can't go back anymore. Like, I, I, you know, they have that threshold, like, where it's like, you can't go back point anymore. Of no return. Yeah, the point of no return, right? Uh, where I, I did that, and I was like, okay, well, we're going to plunge. Yeah. Like, we moved out to San Diego in 2005, bought a house, was working at a local church. That's the guy who introduced me to corporate chaplaincy. Oh. So it was this mentor at a Presbyterian church. He had this idea, mainly because the church wasn't growing and he needed a way to fund himself. Mm -hmm. So he had some business owners that he knew and he said, "Uh, what if I offer you chaplaincy services? Well, they tried it. Uh, Enter Roy. And I'm telling my mentor at the time, like, I really love caring for people and I, I love being a youth pastor. I think, I, how do I do this all the time instead of me doing this at night and then still driving to Orange County to work? Mm. Wow. So he says, uh, I have this idea, and I think you'd be great at it. Like, you, you already have a heart for people, and you're really comfortable in the work I- environment. Why don't you become a corporate chaplain with me? And I'm like, okay. Like, <laughs> it's not like I was thinking as a kid, like, gee, Willikers, like, I can't wait to be a corporate chaplain, right? Like, I had no imagination for that. Dream come true. That's yeah. right. Yeah. You know, like, I, I did it, right? Um, so I, I tell people, like, I stumbled onto it, and providentially, I think God was at work, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but that's kind of a long way of saying, you know, this is how I became a corporate chaplain. Mm. So you've been with Hohen Motor Group, which is like a here in North County, San Diego, yeah. they own a ton of dealerships. Mm-hmm. How many employees? Uh, uh, for post, I mean, pre-pandemic, they were like 600. Okay. Post-pandemic, they're at four. Okay. Yeah. And so enter Roy into this corporate scene. How are you received? I, I just, I'm viewing like yeah. car salesmen and just kind of the lifestyle that goes along with that. And then a chaplain is hired to come along and, and help out our, in you know, our, our, corporate culture? Like, how are you received? Yeah. What does that initial onboarding look like in that culture? Yeah. I mean, the dealer group was new to this. I'm new to it. So, uh, I, I'm sure I made a lot of mistakes. Um, uh, and, uh, so it's been, obviously I, I've been doing it for almost 17 years. Mm. At, um, and the reception I think has been, I mean, there haven't been any complaints that I know of. <laughs> so I'll start with that baseline. Um, recently I was caring for someone and the spouse, um, the employee, uh, had been there for a while. The spouse, um, said to me one day, uh, recently, uh, they said, my husband would tell me that there was this pastor at the work site and I had been telling him that he need, that I wanted him to go to church and that I wanted him to be, you know, uh, um, you know, more faithful to God. And he says, well, there's a pastor at my, at my work that I sometimes talk to. And she says, you're a liar. <laughs> <laughs> Don't lie to me. Like, you know, and he's like, no, I'm serious. I'm telling you that. And he says, actually, I have tried to avoid him. (laughs) 
I didn't know this, yes. right? And she's she, and and so the spouse was telling me like he would actually tell me that when he saw you coming, that he would run the other way. And I'm <laughs> That's like, beautiful. Oh my gosh! And she, and I said, well, why do you think he was doing that? And then like all the dirt came out, right? And <laughs> and she was like, I think he was ashamed, and mm. and like you being around reminded him of like he mm. needs to get his life right, right? Mm. Now he's like. Now he calls me pastor. Now he like whenever he's in, you know, going through something, pastor, pastor, you know. Yeah. Um, so I think the reception, I think um, one of my, my current mentors says that people project onto, uh, uh, well, we're talking about me, uh, they'll project onto you, Roy, what, what they want or what they don't want, mm-hmm. right? And so I have to work a lot with like, I have people that want to talk to me all the time. I have people that that will are very quiet around me. I have some people that I'm sure like I walk around and I'm sure maybe they roll their eyes. I I, I don't know, yeah. you know. Um, um, but certainly having a presence of like spiritual care and well being is mm-hmm. going to elicit different things in different people. And part of my education and part of like my formation is saying like, number one, don't take that personal because it's not about me. Mm. And number two, be a very healthy person Yeah, as, as that stuff is coming up because it's all material to see how God's at work in all of our lives. Hmm. Yeah. It's a, inter- it's a peculiar place, chaplaincy, and it's, it's a wonderful, I, I, there needs to be more chaplains. I think there should be more chaplains than pastors. Mm. Um, you know, it's like everybody in ministry kind of aspires to kind of be this in leadership role at a church as a pastor preaching a sermon and chat, which is great and it's needed it's, and it's, yeah. it's essential. Don't get me wrong, but chaplaincy work is, you know, it's you're placed as a missionary, more of a missionary than a pastor. And it's like this, it's beautiful tension of both. And, yeah. and you have to you're part of that culture. They're not coming into your culture. Church right. is a, a strange place Sunday morning mm-hmm. where, like you said, this place of, of work, of commerce is one where, you know, like you're not going to be well received some days, you know, it's not like, you know, no one's treating you like the local Catholic priest, you know, as you walk out of mass on Sunday morning, they're, yeah, you know, they're going the other way. So how, how did you navigate that, like in in your kind of formative years, as you're learning to be a chaplain, learning to minister and exist in this space? Um, what was your spiritual journey like? Um, well, I, I, I first of all, I think that that maybe a, a, a way to frame it is to say that we should all be uh, uh, Christ followers on mission. Yeah, and if we're pastors, we should we should constantly be saying we are pastors on mission, right? So that we, th- there's not a, du- a, a duality. Right. There's not a fragmentation. We are missional pastors. We should be pastors on mission. That's part of what we do. And lay people, right? People who are called to the workplace, they are Christ followers on mission, right? What do you mean when you say, like, what does on mission mean for you? Yeah, so, um, you know, the, the big, again, there's going to be people that are a lot smarter uh, with this than I am. The, the big over arching uh, thought is this big theological assumption that uh, God is a God of mission, mm-hmm. right? That that um, God has a goal. God has a vision. Like there is a goal, right? It starts in the garden and it ends in a city, mm-hmm. you know? And the whole goal is this union. It's creation. It's delight. It's, it's union with God, union with each other, union with creation. Mm-hmm. And that God has this mission that he he actually kickstarts in Genesis one, mm-hmm. not Genesis three, not Genesis twelve, not in Matthew. It's actually at the inception of creation. He's working. Mm-hmm. Yeah, God is working. So part of God's mission is work, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. We can get into that later, but that's what I mean by mission. Gotcha. Okay, yeah. so God God is a God of movement. And it's it's towards health, flourishing, creativity. Yeah, shalom, peace. Right. Like God, like if you're thinking about it from a business perspective, God has outcomes. Mm. <laughs> like it, it, God's not hiding it in the Bible. He's saying, "Love me, love others, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, flourish, thrive, and help others to do that." Like yeah. that's the outcome. That's what it should look like. Yeah. So, anyways. So when you're on, on mission in the marketplace, yeah. is it? Um, like, are you there 
evangelizing people and trying to convert them or what like yeah so the chaplaincy tradition is that uh we we cannot proselytize we are not there to try to convert people to our religion we are there to be um uh, a, a ministry of presence. Uh, it, it feels, um, I'm not a hospital chaplain or a hospice or military chaplain, but it feels like the, the, the goal is very clear in those contexts. You're in a hospital and you're sick, call the chaplain to pray and provide care, mm -hmm. right? Military, you're going to war, uh, you're dealing with uh, life and death situations, call the chaplain if you want spiritual care and well-being. Mm -hmm. In the workplace, it's a whole different game. Yeah. It's a whole it's a whole different mindset. I am there to to provide spiritual care and well-being, but I have to earn that trust with people. I have to build relationships with people. I have to get to know them. They have to get to know me. Mm. And and we have this context of work that we're thinking about, which is why I'm doing my doctorate of ministry in uh, leadership and organizational health, because when I got trained as a chaplain, it was all one-to-one -one care, soul care, right. which I use a lot. Right. But how do you incarnate the presence of God in a workplace and think about the things that God cares about? Hmm. You know, the cultural mandate. Like at a systems-wide level. At a systems-wide level. Organizational health. Right. Okay, I got you. When like, uh, you know, kind of, the initial question of like, how did theology of work and that spiritual journey come to be? When I first started hearing about theology of work, it was like 15 years ago. And the biggest premise was God cares about work. That was the, that's about the extent that theology of work went. Mm -hmm. Well, that's since whoever started plowing that has really like allowed it to expand mm. So you got thinkers like Tim Keller that are writing like uh, uh, about theology of work. They did some amazing things at Redeemer in New York. Mm -hmm. They had this thing called the Gotham Institute. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, like, what's the coolest name, <sighs> right, for a theology of work? Did Batman go there? Yeah, I, I, yeah, probably. <laughs> yeah, but they're like they had they have like Wall Street execs coming to the Gotham Institute. They have artists. They have. Um, people from different career and vocation, and it was one of their biggest hits, mm -hmm. right? Maybe. So now, like, theology of work is expanding and deepening a lot more, where, like, someone like me is it would hear, like, well, God cares about your work. Uh, th those aren't the questions that the workers I'm working with are asking. Mm. They have different pain points. They have different things that they're struggling with, right? And so um, theology of work for me at this point is, like, uh, how does God, what does God have to say about systems? What does God have to say about organizational health? What does God have to say about the, the health um, and flourishing of that system and the people? So it's not just one bottom line. There's actually multiple bottom lines. Yeah. And I think that's, I'm hoping that part of the shift that I'm doing with my writing and that I talk about is that owners start to think and employees start to think like, I'm not just here for the money. That's one bottom line of yep. several, mm -hmm. right? So you have this like movement um, of, of, of like Peter Sange writing about learning organizations or Harvard publishing a book uh, uh, on develop, uh, on DDOs, development, deliberate developmental organizations that are saying there are multiple bottom lines. Mm -hmm. And if we're going to do this right, then we have to develop people not for our own bottom line, but for the common good of this world. Mm. Wow. That blows me away. Yeah, that's so cool. Because I think that's what God takes delight in. I think that's what mm. God wants for organizations. And here you're being shaped and formed in a company for 40, 50 hours a week. My hope and dream is that like companies are thinking, how do we think about multiple bottom lines? How do we think about developing people, mm -hmm. right? Emotionally, mentally, mm -hmm. right? Not so that they serve only the bottom line of this right. company. So they make more widgets. But like the outcome needs to be, this person's a better person personally and professionally because they, we got to work with them. Mm -hmm. And we're better because we got to work with them. Yeah, it's sort of this this holistic integral version that challenges a lot of the specialization that capitalist 
economies drive us towards oftentimes. It's like, hey, like let's specialize or, or the industrial revolution, right? I mean, it brought about giant economies of scale as did globalization, but that tears us apart in terms and says, well, hey, your job is to be very good at only X. And that ends up excluding all aspects, all these different aspects of who we are as people yep. and why it's important that in order to live a meaningful life, we have to be uh, bound to or woven together um, across a number of different mm -hmm. planes. And that That's we can't, so we're not just going to find satisfaction in um yeah like my work over in the office there like my my job isn't just to pound out as many stories as possible right it's to ask well hey which are what are the the best stories that will lead to yeah the most sparked imaginations and curious minds and heart that will go out into the world seeking to find and see god in all places not just in in church you know it's interesting when you're talking you know one of our our dispatch series is we're following, you know, Mark Palm and Samaritan Aviation over in Papua New Guinea. And so when people think, use the terminology of missions, I think we oftentimes still carry this vision of ascending missionaries and we've got no problem with that, right? We're covering people who are, are being sent and who are going out into all the nations of the earth. And, mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's so exciting to me to see how their perspective about what missions looks like has been growing and evolving. You know, I mean, yeah. core to Samaritan Aviation's thing is they're not just there trying to save souls. They're there trying to provide medical care mm -hmm. to communities that are underserved and marginalized and who don't have access to it, right? Yeah. And they view, well, community and individual health is key to God's care and concern. And I hear you saying that in your context, that, hey, <coughs> this the workplace is where people live. Like, I mean, we spend most of our time there. And um, so how might they become these fertile places where we can be shaped into a, a, a more holistic v vision of what it means to be human, that God cares deeply about? And so... I'm, I'm ex looking for my question in all of this. Um, but I guess part of it is how does, what excites you the most about um, this idea of the workplace as the new mission field? Um, and do you think that that's something that the church is doing a good job of embracing or a bad job? Like is the future of, of, um, of the church actually in the, the workplace and not on a Sunday? Uh, no, I don't think that's the future. I, I think that uh, um, my, my, here's a plug. My friends, uh, Corey Wilson and Matthew Kamick, uh, Matthew's a, a professor at Fuller and Corey's at, um, Calvin Seminary. They co-wrote a book called Work and Worship. It is very dense. It is very academic. Um, they meant for it to be that way. Um, but one of the things that they're saying is that there, when we fragment work and worship, mm. um, work becomes unjust and worship becomes defiled. Mm. Oh, wow. So that when our worship is much more influenced by idolization and consumerism, it actually, it actually deforms us and we take those practices into work and then we create unjust work systems. Oh, wow. I mean, it, 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 they obviously do a lot better job of articulating that concept, but in the Old Testament, there was no separation between like government, work, and the people. It was an, integ an integrated system, mm. right? You know, now we've separated them all, mm. and I think all of them are hurting because of that mm. in some ways, right? So you're talking about like these different parts of who we are. Um, the future of the church needs to keep uh, uh, thinking about mission from a from a uh, from a Genesis one perspective, not just from a uh, let's let let's get out of dodge, right? Let let's 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 have this escapist mentality that I'm, I'm I got my free ticket into heaven and you know to heck with whatever happens here, right? Mm. Mission is no, we have to care about creation, we have to care about being in harmony with it, we have to see it heal and whole. Um, and we have to also acknowledge that we bring our own sin and brokenness into what we create, mm -hmm. yeah. right? Into our workplaces. Like our workplaces are filled with God's goodness and they're filled with our horrible, bad impulses mm -hmm. that we need to take responsibility for, right? So I think like, um, 
I forgot what your question was now, but <laughs> sorry about well, your, that. Your answer <laughs> was better than my question. So yeah. thanks. <laughs> but, but, but I do think that like, I think the church, uh, I think some local churches, uh, I mean, North Coast Calvary is one that's been thinking, they have their bottom line ministry. They've been thinking more about, you know, faith and work. Uh, and so I'm, I'm really excited to see my friends like Crystal, right. Who is, uh, leading that charge, um, and, and thinking through how do we disciple people, right. Uh, mm -hmm. for the workplace. Um, and, so, and I think there's other churches that are catching on to that. Uh, I, I do think that my hope would be that one day I'm in church and like my wife, Christina, <laughs> she's going to hate me for saying this, is like writing a liturgy that in, is inviting people to say, most of us want to check our work week at the door and we just want to feel good in here, mm -hmm. right? We want to lift our hands and sing some songs and feel uplifted. Mm. And we need that. We need to be reminded of the real story, the gospel story, right, uh, through our liturgy at work, uh, at, at, in worship. I want, I'm hoping that worship leaders start to say like stuff like, if you had a really horrible week where you had to make some really hard decisions and you saw like the brokenness of people and systems, let's take a moment to lift that up to God. Mm. Let's take a moment to see how God is with you in that pain, in that lament. Let's offer our laments of the work, right? Mm. At the same token to say, like, a lot of you might have had some successes. You, you might have had some breakthrough. You might have been working on a project that you finally saw the light of day and you got funding, right? You, let's thank God for that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's praise God for that so that we have, to, so that we start seeing more of an integration, yeah. right, of our work and our worship. Mm. I like that. I, I like that too, and I need that. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm. We talked <laughs> a lot to. <laughs> I just that was a fire hose. I'm, yeah, you gotta get us a minute to. Yeah. Play at our PFDs and <laughs> um, personal flotation device. Yeah, yeah. I love it. Yeah. Right. Um, well, Roy, I I, I want to talk a little bit about your home life. Um, you know, it's like you're, you know, as one as who's so. Um, thoughtful about um, you as an individual, as God's beloved, operating and functioning for the sake of others in the corporate environment. Um, talk to us about being a dad, being a husband. Um, those are probably the two hardest vocations that that I. Um, uh, those are probably the two hardest and most life giving vocations that I have. Mm -hmm. uh, those two vows to be a, a husband and to be a father. Um, do you think as deeply about being a dad and a husband as you do being a chaplain? Um, I probably more so. Um, and I think that probably informs more of my chaplaincy work. Uh, like, I don't think it's the other way around. I'm, I'm trying to be someone who is thinking about, like, I really, I mean, it sounds weird to say it, but I, like, I feel like I took a, I did take a vow, right, in my marriage, and I took, but I also made a vow to be a good father, and so uh, I, I, um, I, Christina is like the person that I I love the most, and that I struggle with the most, <laughs> but mostly because of me, mm. right? Um, so I I feel like I work out a lot of my pastoral presence in my marriage and with my kids. I'm trying to figure out like how do I live with people that see all of me, mm. you know, and, and not be one person at home and then be another person in the workplace. Cause that's exactly what we were just talking about. It's right. like one being one person on the weekend or at church and being, and having to put a different hat on Monday morning. And that's just not the case. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's not, not, not be the case rather. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to like, you know, think through, you know, my marriage and like the dynamics that, that I, uh, that I find a lot of delight in and that I, ha that I, what are the pain points in my marriage and in me, right? Mm -hmm. Same thing with my boys, you know, thinking through like, how do I, um, uh, I grew up in a, in this Pentecostal setting that basically like I had a prophetic word every other week and it was, you're going to, you know, do great things in this world. You're going to preach to the nations. You're going to, you know, uh, uh, save many. You're going to dot, 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 right? Everything's about great being great, 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 great. Mm -hmm. And the bar that I've set for my kids is that you guys need to get a 
professional degree, like you're going to college, you know, and if, if you can just pay your bills and you can have good friends and do some common good in this world. Success. Success. Mm. You know? And so, uh, like right now I have a, my son, my youngest son, David, he's a, a junior and he's really not sure what he wants to do after high school. So I created a note. And I said, David, these are all the things that I see that you take joy in and that you take delight in. Mm. Now I want you to start listing things that you find joyful and, and you take delight in. And I want you to list the things that give you, like, they just, they feel dark. They feel hopeless. They feel, because I think seeing both of those things, he's going to discern, right, what next steps could look like. And we, there's no, like, pressure or rush for him to do that. But yes, that's mm. how critically I'm thinking, like mm. I'm thinking about his own formation and, and I'm thinking about how I've mucked that up, how I've screwed up his formation and, you know, and, and how I'm trying to take responsibility for that and say, oh, you're doing that because of me, man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, dude, that move that you just did right there, which is, a, I mean, brilliant one. Hey, uh, here are the, here are the things that I see that bring you joy, um, that animate you and to begin to name some of those for him and invite him into that process. That is totally the move of a spiritual director. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to steal that move. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm going yeah. to steal that in all sorts of different ways. Uh, but I, that's one thing I wanted to talk to you about that's so unique about you uh, that's been honed throughout your, your life and through your chaplaincy. But, you know, you went and you studied spiritual direction and you are a certified spiritual director. And for most people, in, like most people, even if they've grown up in religious traditions that have spiritual direction as an element of it, I don't think people really understand what it is mm -hmm. and why I think that the posture of the spiritual director um, is something that's so, the posture and the skill set is so desperately needed in our culture right now. I think they're more effective in lots of ways than the classic pastor or missionary model, because so much of it, as I understand it, is rooted in, in listening mm -hmm. and just asking good questions. So can you, um, I want for you to help us understand a little bit about like, well, what does spiritual formation look like? What is it? What is it not? You know, um, and why might it be a good resource for people now in our cultural moment? Mm. Uh, that's a really good question, Joseph. Um, okay, so there's two things that come to mind. The, the first one is that um, I got trained in a lot more of what's called Ignatian spiritual spirituality, right? The Jesuits, mm -hmm. St. Ignatius of Loyola. And his premise was that God works in the deepest parts of our desires. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember saying this some time ago, um, and and someone said like, whoa, like th that's heretical. Like, you know, desires are bad. Mm. Right. And, uh, and, and, you know, I asked the person, well, tell me more about that. <laughs> right. And no, you know, that could really lead you this, that, and whatever. And I'm saying, well, you know, but can't God redeem and reconcile and renew those desires? And mm -hmm. isn't maybe, there, maybe he authored them and maybe he authored them. Right. This person was specifically thinking of like sexual desires uh, and yeah. going deviant. Right. Mm -hmm. So when we think of desires, I, I feel like whatever, wherever the state of someone is, right, whatever their, their, their demons are, they're, they're going to be like, well, no, you know, I, I, I desire alcohol. I desire, mm -hmm. you know, and as a spiritual director, I would say, tell me more about why you're drinking so much. Mm. You know, t t tell me about that. How is God with you? Right. How is God working in you? What, what might God be saying to you? Like there's a deeper longing in that person that is, has addictions, right? We all know that. Like, mm -hmm. you know, so from a spiritual direction perspective, it's, um, it's Jesus asking, uh, uh, Bartimaeus, what do you want me to do for you? Mm. I, I mean, he knows the story. He, he sees what's happening right? Jesus does, but he needs the son of Timaeus, right? Which we don't even know his name. We just know him as son of Timaeus, mm -hmm. uh, to, to say like, I, I want to see, right? Mm -hmm. And, and then Jesus says like, your faith has made you whole, right? Mm -hmm. But it's Jesus asking us those questions. It's Jesus saying, what do you want? I mean, it's in the what verbiage. Do yeah. well, what do you want? Yeah. What do you want? I feel like that is the most 
like power packed question that we could be asking ourselves all the time. What is it that I truly want? Mm -hmm. And and so the, like the basis of spiritual direction is in some ways saying, what desires has God seated you with Mm -hmm. and is stirring in you? And in some ways, where are you repressing that and depressing that Mm -hmm. so that you're not being fully you? Hmm. I'm forgetting the the verse that it actually is. Maybe you can help me. Um, but you know, it's the one where God will give you the desires of your heart. Oh yeah, the Psalms. Yeah. I think it's Psalms. your ways to the Lord. And he yeah, will isn't it like Psalm thirty or Psalm thirty four? Yeah, I'm not the best say, at that. Yeah. yeah, I was gonna say it's like twenties or thirties. It's in it's yeah. in there. Thirty seven. Uh, but I've been meditating on that. Like uh, it's been stuck in my head, and because I do genuinely believe that yeah, action is is born out of desire, whether it's righteous action or whether it's, it's malformative action, and the, a lot of the work that I do in. Um, in the men's skills ecosystem over at, at church, um, and you know, plug for my other podcast, Free to Love, <laughs> Transforming Pain to Peace. Um, <laughs> ding. But it is, I mean, it's based off of ex- exactly what you're saying that, well, hey, desires are real, they're, they're innate. You cannot, like, they're gonna manifest themselves in some way. And when we think about that verse of, oh, God will give you the desires of your heart, we usually think of that as this materialistic, uh, materialistic wish list, mm-hmm. you know, like, well, hey, I really want, um, these shallow things, because isn't that so often our response when we're asked that sort of question? Well, what do you want? Well, I, I want to be free of pain. I want to feel like, you know, I, I want to be successful. I want to be esteemed. Um, or it's even shallower than that. It's like, I want a new iPhone. I want this mm-hmm. car. I want to go snowboarding. I want to go fly fishing next week, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but I've been thinking, the more I've been like thinking on that, I've realized my prayer has changed to say like, well, man, the desires that I have had and that I have lived out have so often led to dissatisfaction and destruction. Mm-hmm. They're, they're those immature desires mm-hmm. of my youth. Um, and so I can't really trust my own desires in some ways if I'm looking at the fruit of them. But there is this promise that God has that, well, he'll give me the desires of my heart. So could it mean, in fact, that verse that he's trying to give me, he wants to and will give me deeper, better, truer desires, that if I receive them from him uh, and then begin to act out of those desires will lead to a life on mission. Mm -hmm. It will lead to a life of flourishing. It will lead to me pursuing and consuming or engaging with stuff that brings life and connection rather than death and disintegration. That is so good, man. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm thinking about like, um, uh, uh, so in spiritual direction, when we're trying to name our desires, they could be disordered mm. at first. I might say, I want to be like, for example, I had this vision that I was going to be a pastor of a church. It was going to be 500 members. After service, I'm going to go out to lunch with people. I'm going to go home, take a nap, and then we're going to have our evening service, and I'm going to pray for people. And it was very cookie cutter, right? Mm -hmm. That was my desire. Is it a bad desire? No, that's not a bad desire. Uh, But I noticed something lurking underneath that desire. Mm -hmm. And underneath that desire was this sense of like, when I attain that, then my life is going to be dot, dot, dot. Yeah. When I attain that, then people will know that I'm successful and that I'm good and, and that I'm a prominent leader in the community, right? Mm-hmm. And so then I noticed that this, there was this other desire of like, oh, I, I, I want to be influential. I want to, you know, I want to be somebody. And if I can do that, write the book, mm-hmm. be on podcasts, uh, go on my speaking tour. I did it. Yeah. I've become an American pastor, <laughs> right? I've, I've succeeded. And either I wasn't good enough to do that or I was constantly being checked, right, by the Spirit, or that's not really who I am. Mm. And... I had to see those desires reordered and healed Mm -hmm. so that it's now a lot more of like, I think the deeper desire at this point in my life is I want deep meaning. I want deep connection with God and with others and with myself. 
and I want to cultivate the kind of life in my marriage, with my kids, with my chaplaincy work, with my music, with my spiritual community, where I am seeking to serve mm -hmm. and I am seeking to cultivate common good. Mm -hmm. And I think I have some skills to offer that. And I, I, I don't know, maybe I will be a, a, a pastor of a congregation at some point. I've, I already feel like I'm pastoring people, mm -hmm. right? It's just the marketplace congregation. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I think it's slowing down enough, listening, retreating, slowing down, being honest to say what's underneath that desire. Because, because we still have morals that we have to like bump up against, right? Like mm -hmm. is making money an idol? No. When it becomes my ultimate thing, then it's my idol, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I don't knock people for wanting to make money. Some people are just geniuses are at doing that. <laughs> I wish I had that ingenuity. That's not my gifting, but some people have that gifting, right? But when it becomes the ultimate good, right? Just like pastoring, yeah. mm -hmm. we make pastoring our ultimate good. Like Easy. Yeah. It, it's, it's a lot easier for us to do that than, you know, than other professions, mm -hmm. right? But it's, it's us being able to be vulnerable enough with ourselves, with God, with other people to say, okay, I long for this. Tell me more about that. Tell me how that was birthed. What are other people saying? Mm. Well, other people saying that I suck at singing. <laughs> well, then maybe you're not called to be a singer. <laughs> Which is why you're a drummer. That, that, yeah. <laughs> but, but yeah, so spiritual direction has helped like um, uh, slow down, uh, ask, um, ask questions that are trying to point people back to God's presence. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, uh, when we get to know God, we get to know ourselves mm. fully. Yeah. When we get to know ourselves, we get to know who God is. Mm. There's this interplay that's happening. Mm -hmm. And I think spiritual direction is helping to create that space where we're, we're able to ask those questions of curiosity, of learning, of growing in the presence of God uh, as the ultimate director. Mm. Yeah, and that's why I love it is so distinct from, uh, from pastoral work or to bring it back to the open of our conversation to the therapeutic uh, space, which is so prevalent these days. And also, I mean, in the online sector, gurus of all shapes and sizes. You can't, there's constantly experts who are saying, "Well, hey, X is what you need. To, you know, you just just stack these habits, or right. take these supplements, or do these exercises, and you'll be spiritually, emotionally, or physically like, you know, healthy, wealthy, and wise." It's mm -hmm. this. Uh, it's this this cloaked version of the prosperity gospel in a lot of different ways. Yeah. You know. Um, yeah. And, and, it's, and it's easy clickbait. Yeah, you, you just gave me five steps. Who doesn't steps, want those? And totally. who doesn't want those, right? Absolutely. But we have these these authority figures and these experts who are saying, "Well, here's the right. Here are the answers and the things you need to do mm -hmm. to get the life that you want." Mm -hmm. And the spiritual director space is one of profound authority and influence, but ultimately, it's humility and it's this assumption that well, God is already present and is already at work. Um, the thing that you, like you said, we're probably moving too fast mm -hmm. and we're probably not listening or asking, like if we're asking questions, we're probably not waiting to hear replies. Yeah. So this assumption that God is already always, he's the God on mission. Mm -hmm. He's the one who is moving first mm -hmm. towards us in every every dark, dark or light desire in every joy or challenging situation. Yep. Yep. And it's our task as free and empowered individuals to seek him, to mm -hmm. be curious and to say, well, hey, you do, you care. You, ha you care about this given situation. You care about the outcomes. What might those look like? And what might I be able to do in partnership with you, God, to affect positive change? Can you write that down and then like I'll steal it and that'll be Absolutely. my spiritual direction. It's now bio. Roy and my podcast and you're the guest. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well Father said. Joseph. Well said. Well, hey, I want to shift gears if that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, I want to talk. We we had a great outing uh, a couple months ago. Um, we went down to the border we went, mm -hmm. and uh, we went into Tijuana with our friend Jane. And uh, interesting story is we had we we're getting ready to send James Barkman into the field in Burma. And so we just got a complete camera kit and we needed to do a field test. I'm like, Hey, well, let's, let's go down with everybody. And, uh, 
let's film it. And so we filmed you kind of guided us on this journey to meet Dona Maria and just to kind of see a very contentious place. Anytime you bring mm -hmm. up the border, it just brings up so many political, <clears throat> well, I think this, I think that, and that's how it is. And, and the borders, um, it's messy in so many different ways. Yeah. And you did such a great job as, as James was testing out this camera, you kind of guided us through this beautiful day of getting to meet some, some migrants, getting to meet some, uh, some people who have immigrated up from Central America and were just caught in the confusion of trying to make a better life for themselves. And um, so talk to us a little bit about that day. How was that through your perspective? And then everyone's going to get to see it because we're going to release it. Mm. Uh, it's probably actually the same time this podcast comes out. Uh, well, I mean, you, you, you were a really good coach, <laughs> Joel. <laughs> it's called director. Yeah. Um, okay. Not I a mean, spiritual I, director. Yeah. Just, 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 just director. You were a great director. Uh, so, um, yeah, I, I think it was, uh, I mean, for one, like you said, like there's a lot of contention and complexity, uh, with border issues. Um, I think, um, I think as I'm getting older, I actually want to lean into more complexity and I have a gut reaction to say, well, just do this. And you know, that's going to fix it all, mm -hmm. which is like, you know, I do that in my marriage all the time. And then I end up in trouble. <laughs> um, uh, so I think like doing an immersive, uh, experience like that and really trying to see like, uh, how is it that someone like Doña, like number one, why is Doña Maria doing this? Mm -hmm. How is God at work with her and among the community that she is gathering, right? Uh, and organizing. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the feeling of like, God, this is so complex. Like, where do you even start? And she is starting with something really simple. She's providing food and shelter and and a few legal resources along with Jane, mm -hmm. uh, right? And partnering with people like Jane. Mm -hmm. um, and she's been doing it for 40 years. And she's been doing it for 40 Long years. Long suffering, it's not a new crisis. No. That's it, what I was, that yeah. was one of my takeaways. Yeah, and it's a, it, it's a, it is, it's a very long history of her doing that. Um, and for her to feel like, my sense was that she, I don't think she would articulate it like this, mm -hmm. but my sense was that she felt a call that where, where she had this deep desire to meet this pain point, right? And she's trying to figure out, well, what's my part in this? You know, so I tried to ask her a little bit of like, how did you get to this point? Like, how long have you been, how long have you been like this? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know? Um, and so uh, really trying to also see like, well, God, how are you at work here? Like, where are the moments of, joy in the midst of pain in the midst of complexity and um and to try to like tease that out yeah and that was hard mm. it's hard yeah you know that, that's not my world uh i i'm, I'm mexican-american um and um you know she's she is housing people who are from latin america different parts of 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 uh, south america um and it was really painful, you know, the, the, uh, the other startling thing is that they didn't want to leave home. Mm. It's out of desperation. And I, I often think like, what do we do when we're desperate? Mm -hmm. How do we survive? You know, like we're going to do things and we might have to try things and do things that we're, we're not accustomed to, you know, they, you know, some of these people were putting their lives on the line to try to seek asylum, mm. you know? Um, that's, that's hardcore, man. That's next level. Yeah, it is messy. And I think that's, I think that's what Christianity ought to look like from this point forward in this world. It's mm. not like the world, the society is trying to organize and categorize and the gospel subverts it all, you know? And yeah. it's like, can the gospel, um, work in a place that's so complex, like, this border, these two bordering towns, the most, one of the most affluent cities in the world, which just so happens when the sun sets behind it, it turns golden, mm. has this golden hue for everybody in Tijuana who's looking at it, one of yeah. the most uh, poor cities in the world. And 
how does the gospel work in a place like that? And it's so awesome to see someone like Dona Maria, who's like, she wasn't preaching at us. She wasn't saying you Americans, this, or you, you know, this is the political solution. She's just like, Hey, uh, here's some Turkey with salsa on it. I'd never had that before. Oh, it, was, it was great. It was you know amazing. what I mean? And, <laughs> yeah. and just to be there with just to be present. You, you talked about presence ministry mm -hmm. earlier and it was so awesome to have such a talented group of people like yeah. yourself, Jane, Jane all these amazing. people. I mean, you guys have, you know, probably a lot of ideas on how to solve that. And yet every, we were just with the people that day as yeah. Dona Maria had been for 40 years. It was really beautiful. Well, it's making me think of Good Friday today, right? Like, um, you, you know, the anticipation that Christ was going to redeem, renew, save. Uh, some people believe that, uh, you know, during his earthly public ministry. And then he gets hung on a cross and all hopes and dreams are shattered. And then it feels like, well, this is hopeless. Mm. You know, we're still under imperial rule. We don't even have, we don't even have ownership of our own land right now. We're under the rule of, of, of Roman guard right now. And uh, it feels like some of the big global complex challenges that we have in this world feel like Good Friday. Mm -hmm what can we like, it, this is hopeless. This is too big. But I think like the Paschal mystery, right? The fact that there is death, burial and resurrection, like that's the gospel. Yeah. Like that's what should be animating us and saying like, well, this feels like it's the end, but it's not right. Like the good news is at work here. Mm -hmm. And it just takes, um, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs says that, um, uh, God's actually waiting on us to take initiative, hmm. to be the problem solvers. And so much of evangelical thought sometimes <coughs> is, well, God's going to do it. God's going to do it. And God's like, I'm not going to do it. You're going to do it. And we're going to partner. Mm -hmm. The great co-mission. The great co-mission, right? We are co-participants, co-creators. We're not God. We're not equal to God. But for whatever reason, God uses humanity to become collectively responsible, morally responsible, and for us to get off of our tushes and finally say like, I am part of the problem, and so I need to be a part of the solution. That's right. Yeah. And that's what pressed in on me going over there. Yeah. Is that this is my problem. This is our problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't care where you are politically on this matter. Like this is, the more we can say like, this is our problem, mm -hmm the more we can discern how God is calling us to do our bit. That's right. And it doesn't just start and end at the border too. It's like, like no. what's happening in Central America? That's where I wonder, how is the, where is the gospel solutions in the places that are causing people to need to leave and uproot and try to, you know. Yeah, that's... How, how, how is God on mission in Venezuela, yeah. Honduras? Yeah. Like, doesn't God care about that land? Yeah. I, I, again, I am not like a, a political scientist. And, and there's people that are a lot smarter than this, but in my small mindedness, I think crud, how do we pray for the healing of Venezuela yeah. for it to thrive and flourish the way God has ordained it, right? Instead of like, like, like the outcome should be that we're trying to get over there to go hang out over there, not people running away from That's it. That's right. Yeah. Right. And if we're a globally chained system now, we have a part in that, mm -hmm. right? We're, we're, our part isn't to fix it, but how can we partner with God and the local people to say, how is God at work here? And how do we come alongside you yeah. and mobilize you? Yeah. Amen. Sounds like uh, we've got a host of a, of an ongoing series called Destinations mm -hmm. and uh Taking you back out in the field, my friend. We're gonna get some more Roy, complexity like for you to lean done. into. You're like a Hispanic Anthony Bourdain. Ooh. So like about one of the biggest like compliments that he can give. It's the biggest. There's literally a a candle in his office. For Saint Anthony? For Saint, Saint Anthony. Anthony. Ugh, yeah. I love it. That guy was brilliant. <laughs> He's great. Dude. And well, what I loved about Bourdain is that he was an obs he was he had eternal curiosity. Mm -hmm. He had eternal courage to just go into the gnarliest places and just to be present with people. And, yeah. and it was interesting how he really reshaped journalism 
and storytelling, you know, and uh, I really like he was comfortable in all those situations. So anyways, I look forward to, to more episodes. Let's go film some more, buddy. May we break bread like Bourdain did? Yes. <laughs> yes. And be storytellers. Um, Dude, yeah. I just got some, I got some hot takes. You got some hot takes? Dude, I got some hot takes. Ooh. So hot takes is, uh, is how we try to end uh, episodes with guests where it's just r- like rapid fire round. Done. So like, for example, I'll ask you an impossible question. Like, um, who is the greatest drummer in the world? Ooh. In the world? Yeah. yeah. All time. Ki- who's the, who's the greatest? Time? Who's the greatest? You just gotta answer it. You yep. just gotta, come, yeah, on. come on. Come on. Got, come on. Lorna Lewis. Uh, okay. Um, what is the best aspect of Mexican cuisine? Uh, the communal aspect of it. And it's really simple products that are just magnified. Okay. okay. Uh, go to taco shop. In North County or anywhere? Uh, just, uh, I mean, go to, um, like if you could just go to. There's none good here. Sorry. Okay. There just isn't. Pr- primos. The, the market. Primos market. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Biggest pet peeve growing up as a drummer? Being told that I'm playing too loud. <laughs> Wait, biggest pet peeve as a drummer as an adult? That I'm being that I'm playing too loud. <laughs> so you build the infrastructure for it, people. <laughs> what kind of music do you enjoy that people wouldn't expect? Ooh, great question. That that they wouldn't expect? Yeah, that they wouldn't expect. Uh, Latin Mexican romances ballads like Luis Miguel. Dude, I okay. love playing okay. that stuff. All right. Okay. Greatest Dodger of all time. Oh man. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna say Kirk Gibson because of Kirk. Gi- oh wow. The bottom of the ninth. Yeah. That, that, yeah. It, this it's is the phenomenal. most epic for me. Great but I was call. gonna say Oral Hershiser. I. I Okay. Yeah. Thought, 1988. And then I have to say Fernando Valenzuela because my people. Man, really good. But now I gotta say Urias, man. Dude. <laughs> El Culichi. You just invoked 1988, and I have to be honest. Some of these hot takes were I came up with, but then I texted um, Ernie and Christina this morning. Oh, saying, you guys like, are horrible. And so uh, he, he invoked here. a 1988 one. 1998 Lakers versus this year's Lakers. Who wins? Wait, wait. What year? What year? 1988. Eight Lakers. Oh, oh that's uh, Showtime. Oh, show, that's Showtime, showtime bro. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> yeah. easy. How do you really feel about LeBron? I don't like him. I, I feel like I'm gonna appreciate him when he retires. That's a good answer. I think that that's that's my operating uh, thesis on LeBron in general is wow. that he'll be appreciated after he retires. You know what I want him to be? I want him to get more angry on the court. He's too passive for me. It's fair. Mm, dude, that's that's fair. It just makes me feel like he doesn't want it. But I, I mean, I'm not LeBron. I don't know. I mean, and we're living in the post Kobe years too. It's yes. like we had 20 yeah. years of a, a superstar dog. who works so hard and 25% of the time we got us a ring. So, yep. Okay. I've, I just have a few more. And these are from Ernie. Thank you, Ernie, by the way, my dog. Christina, you're um, forgiven for not submitting any because you're busy and important. That's right. Uh, <laughs> a lot more important than me right if now. If spousal opinions were not involved, beard or no beard? No beard. Wow. So Christina likes you with the beard. I, you know, my, my late mom, uh, she loved when I shaved. She would grab my face. She's like, there's my son. So Aww. no beard. Rest in peace, mama. Most meaningful compliment anyone has ever given you? Wow, great question. Dude, we need like a therapy Ernie session. Host this. I mean, I feel like I got that in your intro, man. <laughs> That's why I'm so... Uh, um, probably someone appreciating like the different aspects of me. Okay. Like I'm, I'm not just a chaplain. I'm not just this. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, I don't know. Something like that. Okay, we'll end with the music one because... Well, we didn't talk about your musicianship a ton during this podcast, but okay, we can maybe have much. you back There's on not there. much there. That's <laughs> no, not true. Um, so what genre of music is the most cringy for you? Oh, man. I'm going to get knocked for this. This is my own people, man. I hate mariachi and norteño music. Really? Yes. But here's the thing is I that... I thought you were going <coughs> to say contemporary Christian music. No, I mean, I have to play it, so I have to somehow make it work. <laughs> But I've actually talked to musicians that play Norteño, like uh, banda music, mm-hmm. and I've watched the drummers play, and I cannot do that. Wow. I, I cannot play what they're so skilled. 
Uh, they are so sharp, but like the sounds of Norteño, it's rock, duck, 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 and I'm like, I, I like, there's nothing for me to play here. Yeah, <laughs> but they make it work, and I mean, it's incredible. Yeah, and it, it is incredible. Roy, thanks Gosh, so much, dude. We love you so we much. We hey, so, love you guys, man. We got some. We got you some coffee. Mm. Some Nation's coffee. Nation's care package. Come on the podcast. We got you a sweatshirt. We got you uh, black. some you volume sevens and uh, some stickers. Thanks so much, guys. Look at this golden pin, too. Wow, look at that. You wear that. I just want to say how much I appreciate uh, what you guys are doing. Um, uh, the the kind of space that you're creating. Uh, the, the mission that God has you guys on. It's super creative. Um, it's lived out of your heart. Like this is not like a, this is not a one-off thing for you guys. Mm -hmm. This is like your heartbeat. This is, this is like, this runs in your DNA. And, um, and I think we need more of this kind of creative ministry, uh, for this time that we're in. So I, I deeply love and respect you guys a lot. And I, I feel so fortunate that I, mm -hmm. I can call you guys friends. Thanks, Roy. I mean, gosh, you, have you ever pursued or thought about being a corporate chaplain? I just, I feel so seen. <laughs> I'm willing to be nation's corporate chaplain. Oh, oh. Yes. <laughs> yes. 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 That's a wrap. We're done. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh. Thanks, guys. Well, that was a long one. You'll have to edit it. Gosh. <laughs>